I don't know about you, but my first scientific presentation was a nightmare. When I thought about going to the stage and give a 15 minute talk about my ongoing project that did not have a conclusive data set in my first year of my study, I was about to throw up. Welcome back to PhD Coffee Time. This is the online community for you as a PhD candidate to gain motivation, peer support, and practical tips during your PhD. So I hope by the end of this video, by sharing my own experience on how I prepare my presentation, especially as a non-native English speaker, that will encourage you how you could also prepare a good scientific presentation. If we haven't already met, my name is Vera. I make weekly content on this platform. It's going to support you as a PhD candidate to make you a successful PhD graduate. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss anything in the future that is coming up to be helpful to you. It was New Zealand in July. Um, 15 degrees Celsius was our winter temperature in Hong Kong. So I still remember I walked up to the stage with this gigantic winter jacket. I remember I was shaking and I felt even colder than the winter of New Zealand. So first of all, accept that you will be nervous. Even to this day, I would still say I have a strong feeling when I speak in front of an audience, but I now help myself to identify that feeling as excitement. I am excited and happy to be here and get all your attention looking at me. And I think with this reinforcement, it's going to help you overcome fear. This is the mindset that I hope you can first change. The second mindset is to prepare the slides. And my first PowerPoint of 15 minutes, I almost used the whole week of work trying to get everything right. Even the font size and color will change over the week. And it's almost like a vicious cycle of unproductive time. And I hope by sharing this video, I'm going to direct you to a progressing pipeline of getting your first PowerPoints done without consuming you as much energy. So before you even know to um, prepare a PowerPoint slide, you can already prepare for your, yourself for being the next speaker. When you go to someone's presentation, you can already start taking mental notes on what are the style you like to have, what are the color choices you think that is working well and not working well in that room. With that intentionality, it's going to over the long time save you this puzzling moment to adjust your font type, your color, and playing with something that is a poor contrast so that in the future you have white background and light yellow fonts that nobody can read. You're going to develop sensitivity on how to make good slides is by going to more online webinars. Besides taking scientific notes, give yourself a notebook and try to write down what you like and what you don't like and what is your personal style. Some people like white background, some people like black background, and there are two schools of thought, apparently. People who like black background because they think you will be more focused and people will be more captivated towards that shiny text. But recently I was also learning that if you put a white background to it, you're going to have a, a, a style that looks more like you have a published paper. Tell me in the comment below, do you prefer black background for your PowerPoint or white background like my professors would suggest? From the ecological standpoint, I do know if you use black background, you'll be spending a lot less energy on projecting your slides. So that is also one of the reasons I use black background um, for most of my research work. And I also think black background um, is showing well for microscopy images because a lot of them were having a black background. So if you have a drowning white background, you may not have the same sensitivity to it. Think before even you need to write a PowerPoint on what your style can be and take notes of them. You're going to help yourself save time in the future. As a general rule, if you are allowed to speak for 15 minutes, you will be expected to have an exchange of question and answer for at least like two to three minutes. That is telling you that you can speak for about 12 to 13 minutes. So what most of the time people will give this rule of thumb, 
speaking for one minute per slide type of speed, depending on how many animation you have. This is quite accurate for myself. If I prepare 15 slides for a 12 minute talk, then I'll be more or less on time. So if you have 15 minutes, do not make a 30 slides PowerPoint and expecting yourself to work um, to be able to finish it because by the end you'll be stressed that you can't finish on time. Everyone will be embarrassed by you and you will be even more embarrassed when people have to drag you off the stage. Calculate how much time you will need for each slide and do not over prepare number of slides for your talk. Second rule of thumb is each slide is ideally five or less thing so that first of all you won't just get really intimidated by that slide. You will start with uh, introduction, materials and methods, results and discussion. So a lot of people struggle and they don't know how to start the scene. And one thing I've learned over time is most of the good scientific talk on, in the first five slides resemble a little bit of a micro lecture that it seems like you go into someone's classroom and they teach you something that you don't remember from your high school. So what I recommend is you always start your first slide with something that is a common ground. Even you're going to a conference, there will be different level of experience. So I think the safe ground to start is to assume everyone has the same knowledge from the high school level and bring them to that tip of the human knowledge slowly, scene after scene. So maybe after five slides later, you're going to teach them something to take home and they will be proud of it for knowing your five minute lecture on your topic. So I also imagine it in a way that you are setting a scene almost like a TED talk. You're going to engage everyone in the room to understand the general importance of your work and the specific uh, methodology that you're going to introduce and implement and why should they care? What should they expect from this study? You always start with making sure your audience are all with you. And trust me, if even they are really knowledgeable audience, they will appreciate that you did a good job in teaching because everyone loves to hear about their own field over and over again. That's why they're in that research field. So if you do them good justice in presenting your own research topic with passion and enthusiasm, there's never too basic to start with as long as you progress well and give a good talk. By the end of your introduction, you should be able to do a few things. First is to educate the background of your research by highlighting this big paper that everyone look at, what this taught you in your field and how it advances your research and why you become curious in your own specific objective. Another way of the introduction, you can also start with a nice video, starting with a time-lapse movie, a raise of hand and ask for awareness. How many people have vaccinated yourself with flu shots? And if, you're, if your talk is about influenza and vaccination. Also, you can make an analogy that everyone can relate to. Like if you work on microbiome, you can have an analogy on yogurt. So that's going to bring everyone with the awareness that what you're talking is not too far from them and they get the connection to listen to you. With the materials and methods, I already spoke about illustration in the last video. I think it's powerful to include illustration of your experimental design, your lab photo, procedure you need to do. So make it graphical, avoid using word to explain a methodology is the best if you can illustrate it with the diagram or illustration. And in your result section, I think everyone's result is different. It's hard to just give a general rule of thumb. But one tip I would give is to have a designated color scheme for the factors that you're looking at. If you have a temperature effect, make sure you choose an intuitive color like red is warm and blue is cold. That's going to help your audience understand what data point they're looking at is what treatment, if it is scattered plot, they will know automatically if it is a red, it's like an acidic treatment or warm temperature treatment. Or if you have a drug, you can have brown or black. If you have mortality, you can have like a cross. So think about what's intuitive for people to understand by color and shape, like in the intuitive way. So as you go through all your data and methodology towards the end, a lot of students get into this 
trap on putting a lot of written summary on what they have done. It's almost like a liability waiver form that people put a lot of words saying this, if, if you didn't get it, it's not me, it's all there. What I encourage you can think of doing is to make that visual like an illustration. But you can still keep all the text if, you, if it is your defense, you know, you always want to have that as a backup slide. Consider either using your own illustration or looking at some published review paper and try to cite something that is relevant to your own graphic and annotate on top and say modify from whose paper and we should point to these pathways and think about it as a future study. That would be a lot easier to digest than just writing, we need this pathway X, Y, Z to be analyzed as a bullet point. Another few thing to remember is I found it was not important to add page number on slides until one day someone told me if I add a number on the corner of my slide, people who want to ask specific question to your talk can note the number of slides and ask you exactly which slides to go back to and ask a follow up question. So that's something I didn't consider and it's quite helpful. Also, whenever you cite someone's paper or someone's figure um, as a content source, when you're citing someone's paper, make sure you include the citation in, right in the same slides instead of waiting until the end because nobody's going to read the final slides. And a lot of people will appreciate that you share that information at the spot. So if there is an interesting figure, they can go ahead to educate themselves when they go home later. Of course, before you get introduced for your talk, you got some time standing in front of your cover slide. So don't forget to put your Twitter ID, maybe a 2D code that is going to link to your research gate or whatever to connect with you, your email, put it on your cover slide so that everyone look at you can immediately um, know how to contact you if they have a question or if they have an idea or collaboration for you. So you don't miss any opportunity in that conference because you pay for that registration fee. So might as well be more available to promote yourself. Trust me, I think the accent is something you can work on over time, but if you can deliver good content and nice standalone slides that speaks for itself, you will automatically gain authority and trust. When we are in this age of pandemic, you may be communicating online. It's now more than ever important that you have good graphics to communicate your work. If you're going to give a summary that has powerful graphics, you're going to have a higher chance of engagement and your work is going to be more productive. So that's it for you. I hope today's is helpful. Um, please comment below. Do you use black background or white background for your PowerPoint? Please comment below. And if you like this video, please make sure to hit the like button so that the algorithm knows that this is good content. They will share it to more people as well as sharing my video to your own social media to share with your network and your student. Please make sure to hit the subscribe button if you think my content has been helping you. And until the next time, thank you for watching.